Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday, November 17th Regional Transportation Committee meeting. It is 8.30 a.m. and I will call to order this meeting. Next item, public comments. If there's anybody who wishes to provide public comment, please re raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone and let our master of ceremony, Mr. Cam Kennedy, uh, know. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, can um, is there anybody for public comment? All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll go ahead and open up the lines. If you're on your phone, please press uh, star six. And I'll give that a second. And I, at the moment, I do not see any hand raised, uh, Mr. Chair. All right, Mr. Kennedy, thank you very much. Uh, we'll close public comment at 8.31 a.m. Uh, next item, October 20, RTC meeting summary. If there are any uh, revisions or comments on that, please feel free to raise your virtual hand uh, or press star six on the phone. I will pause. Um, Mr. Kennedy, is there anybody raising their hand at the moment for questions or comments on the meeting summary? No, Mr. Chair, I don't see any hands raised at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I will move on to the uh, next uh, agenda item section. Uh, action items, uh, item four, discussion of TIP COVID-19 impact options. Mr. Cottrell, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. So I think it's appropriate to say that, you know, COVID-19 has impacted every portion of our lives in 2020, including even items discussed here at Dr. Cog. So soon after everything was shut down earlier this year, uh, staff also wondered how this would impact local governments and their TIP projects. So earlier this year, uh, staff held discussions with each of the committees and the board, presenting them with options on what items Dr. Cog can do to assist which then turned into discussions with the affected forums over the last few months. These options presented to them in an attempt to remedy any COVID-19 related delays were agreeable and are outlined in the memo. These options will be part of the project delay discussions and report, which will be coming to you next month for action. So these options include, number one, uh, TIP policy project delay extension. Uh, this allows for a TIP policy variance to extend the time period for project sponsors to initiate their project phases. So for example, if a project experienced a three month delay due to COVID, they may be granted a three month extension to initiate their project phases. So for example, from October 1st to January 1st. This, del this delay would still appear within the project delays report, but due to COVID-19, the delay would quote unquote reset to January 1st. Using this example, if the project, or I should say, if the phase is not initiated by January 1st, and therefore now first year delayed, the sponsor would still have until July 1st before the second year delay appears, with again, possible extensions of that date based on if, if any COVID-19 related issues uh, continue. Uh, one thing to note is that the staff recommendation is that if any delay extension requests are approved for longer than eight months, the funding year would automatically be reprogrammed in the following fiscal year. Um, option number two is to reprogram federal funds. So this option allows project sponsors to request their Dr. Cog allocated funds be reprogrammed to another year without triggering a project delay penalty. And this would be mainly due if there's any match issues, um, local match issues with the sponsor. So for example, if a, if a project had funding in FY20, and it's approved to be moved into FY21, the project phase would also move. The project phase would not be reviewed as part of the FY20 project delay cycle. It would still be noted within the actual delays report, but instead move to the FY21 review cycle. Option three is for apply, apply to CDOT to use toll credits and reduce the project scope accordingly as state toll credits replace local match, but do not provide funding to a project. Therefore, the project scope would have to be reduced. So using an example of a $1 million project with a $800,000 in Dr. Cog allocated funds and $200,000 local match, and the sponsor is unable to provide the $200,000 in local match. If state toll credits are applied, 
the project would need to reduce the project scope by $200,000. Uh, option 3B is very similar and it also uses toll credit, but the sponsor would backfill the local match with Dr. Cog unallocated waiting list funds to make this scope whole. So continuing with this example uh, above, uh, the $200,000 in Dr. Cog allocated waiting list funds would be used to backfill the reduced scope, essentially making the, pro the project whole. And then the $200,000 would be deducted from the appropriate funding available uh, from the appropriate waiting list. As a side note, there is an unallocated, um, there is an unallocated funding available um, to program in that process and is anticipated to begin early next year. So now that we understand the options available, uh, attachment one contains the projects that sponsors wish Dr. Cog to consider when looking at project delays as being affected by COVID-19. Each request will be verified and discussed as we continue through the project delays process and will be part of the delay considerations brought to you next month as mentioned earlier. Um, it's important to point out that these requests in the attachment are not part of your recommendation action this morning but just gives you an idea of the request made by the sponsors. Uh, so at this time, be happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. And again, the action before you is to recommend to the board approval of the options available to the TIP, TIP project impacted by COVID-19. And again, attachment one, uh, which is the individual project sponsor request, is not part of your action this morning. Um, it's just the three options that uh, I talked about earlier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Um, committee members, are there any questions or comments on the information that Mr. Cottrell has provided us? If there is, at this time, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone to let Mr. Kennedy know. Mr. Kennedy, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I see a hand raised from Mr. Doug Tisdale. Uh, Doug, you are unmuted, so please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you very much, sir, and uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to congratulate uh, Mr. Cottrell on a nice uh, presentation. Very clear, very straightforward. And uh, with the chair's kind permission, I would move to recommend to the Board of Directors approval of the options available to TIP projects impacted by COVID-19. Uh, Director Tisdale, thank you very much for the motion and uh, good morning to you as well. Uh, with the motion on the table, I will uh, look for a second. Um, if there is a second, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Mr. Kennedy? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, I see seconded by Mr. Jim Dale and Vince Bussack. Okay, well, let's, uh, um, Mr. Kennedy, uh, please please pick one and uh, open up the lines so we can get a verbal second, please. Okay, uh, Ms., uh, Vince Bussack, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, Vince Buzek here, RTD, I second the motion. Thank you, okay, Buzek. thank you. Um, could we also uh, um, call on, uh, Director Dale, please, just to make sure that he doesn't have a question or a comment. No question or comment. Thank you, Director Dale, I appreciate that. Uh, with a motion uh, and a second, uh, Mr. Kennedy, can we open all of the phone lines, please? Yes, Mr. Chair, I've opened up the lines. Great. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Yes. <laughs> yes. Abstain. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. All right. Uh, the next item, item five, discussion of fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities for the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Mr. Rieger, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Give me just a second. Okay, can everyone hear and see me and see the presentation? 
Looks uh, great, Jacob. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Good morning. Uh, Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cogstaff. So I want to talk today about investment priorities for the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, so let me start a little bit talking about our planning process, what I call the strategic focus for our 2050 plan. Uh, a few things to point out here. One of the most important things of the regional transportation plan is to help implement our Metro vision plan, uh, which is our region's aspirational vision. That was actually so important to our transportation advisory committee that uh, when we get to the um, requested motion, the recommended motion, you'll actually see that reference to uh, Metro vision in the motion. Um, TAC in particular felt that link was really important to emphasize as part of their unanimous recommendation of um, of approving the, the project and project and program investment priorities for the plan that we're going to talk about today. Um, this planning process had a focus on regional policy priorities, um, and we've talked a lot about that in this forum, uh, safety and, and regional vision zero, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'll talk a little bit about House Bill 1261 in a couple slides, uh, regional transit, active transportation, uh, freight, multimodal multimodal mobility and so on. These are things that are, you know, shared values, shared priorities for all of us and a cornerstone of our planning process. Um, one thing that we've already talked with this group about, but I'll remind you again in this slide deck, is explicit programmatic investment uh, addressing some of these policy priorities. We've always had dollars allocated in the regional transportation plan towards these things, um, but this time we put a marker in the ground, so to speak, a little bit about being really intentional of sort of showing you know, we want some dollars to go to some specific things because they're important to the region. Um, emphasis on multimodal projects, um, significant public and stakeholder engagement, um, particularly now that Dr. Cog has a public engagement specialist, we've really tried to up our game in terms of the public outreach and the engagement we're doing as part of the 2050 plan. And then regional collaboration for the region's transportation plan. And what I mean by that is a couple of things. One is the way that we worked with our local stakeholders uh, for example, this is the first regional transportation plan in which we had our county transportation forums and were able to use them to, to help put this plan together. But also, frankly, the partnership between our three agencies, Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. Um, our staff really worked together in partnership on this um, as part of our interagency process that I'll touch on, you know, meeting weekly, sometimes more than, more than uh, weekly uh, for several months to help put this together. Um, and that partnership is really appreciated. Um, some context to uh, our investment priorities that we'll be talking about today. So this is a little bit of Federal Requirements 101, uh, just to touch on them and, and make sure that we talk about them. Uh, we have a Federal Requirement that we need to individually identify regionally significant roadway and rapid transit capacity projects in the plan. So, um, you know, major roadway projects, new roadways, uh, fixed guideway transit, uh, those sorts of things, major capacity projects we need to identify uh, to meet Federal Air Quality Conformity Requirements. We need to identify the implementation staging periods for each of those major projects. Um, again, we do that for air quality conformity modeling. We need to demonstrate reasonable availability of revenues to fund the project and program investments that we're going to have in this plan. The federal term for that is fiscal constraint. It's more commonly known as um, cost feasibility. Um, again, the, this is a long range plan. It's a 30 year plan. It's not a budget document. It's not a transportation improvement program. Um, it's conceptual in some ways, but there are important important investments here, um, and so the federal requirement is that collectively, when we take all of our agencies' revenues and expenditures and everything that goes into the plan, we need to show that it's cost feasible or fiscally constrained. Um, there's also many other federal requirements about our planning process and the products we'll produce, but these are the main ones for our conversation today. Um, so a little bit on the process side that we've talked about with this group before. Um, you'll recall that over the summer, we did a project solicitation and evaluation process um, based on um, a methodology or based on a process that was approved by the Dr. Cog board back in July. We wanted to be transparent how we were going to work with the region to do this work. Um, Dr. Cog staff scored uh, those candidate projects that we received, and we received 137 candidate projects using the objectives from the Metro Vision Plan. Um, we also had a regional evaluation panel that consisted of technical staff from each of our counties and our county transportation forums, uh, as well as the three regional agencies, Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. Um, then we worked together, um, as I alluded to, in what we called an interagency process to um, combine all of that input, um, the project scoring, the input from the regional evaluation panel, 
all the input in the planning process, combining that with the 2050 draft financial plan, which is really driven uh, by the revenues and expenditures of our three regional agencies. And the interagency process put all that together to recommend these project and program investment priorities. Um, once, we, um, once we receive board approval and our RTC recommendation and board approval on these investment priorities for the 2050 plan, then we're gonna transition to the next major technical steps in the planning process, uh, which is conducting our air quality conformity modeling, working on putting the content together for the draft document, having that available um, early in 2021, we actually have a federal deadline that we're assertively working towards. It's a, it's a tight schedule, but our federal partners, Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration, need to review and certify this plan by June 27, 2021. So a very aggressive schedule, but so far we are on track. Um, I wanna spend a moment on our planning framework. This is a slide that you've seen a version of before. Um, the concept here is that um, all of our agencies, all of our local governments have done a lot of really great work over the last couple of years. Um, lots of modal plans, policy plans, um, projects, other things. That when you put all of those together at the local level, our regional agencies, even some things at the state and federal level, collectively, this really is our framework in terms of the vision for the region. This really identifies what our needs are, what our desires are, what our, what our priorities are. And this is the framework that we use in our planning process. Um, I did want to touch on, if you look at the bottom left, at the, the state level, House Bill 1261, um, something obviously that Dr. Cog has been involved in very closely um, as the rulemaking around uh, House Bill 1261, which is a greenhouse gas emissions bill, uh, is being developed. Um, while we know that the sort of final kind of rulemaking, the quantitative guidance from it will come after the adoption of the 2050 plan, we have taken to heart sort of the direction uh, and, the, and the sort of impact of that of that legislation in our planning process, even really before there was a House Bill 1261. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions and air quality is actually a cornerstone of our Metro Vision plan and of the work that we did in the planning process. Um, but we have kept that front and center as we've worked to put together these specific project and program investment priorities. Um, and I think you'll see that in the diversity and the multi, multi modal ability of the list that, um, that we're gonna talk about. Um, I want to be transparent about the input that was used in our 2050 planning process and won't go through all of these point by point. Um, these are in your memo, but again, I want to be transparent about how did we get to the point that we're at today. Um, I talked about the project solicitation and evaluation process that was adopted by our board. Uh, we've also had a lot of engagement uh, from a couple groups that were piloting in this planning process, our civic advisory group and our youth advisory panel. Uh, we meet with them throughout the process. Um, I talked about the, the qualitative scoring from the candidate projects. That was one piece of the process. Um, the regional evaluation panel input that I spoke about, they gave us some direction uh, moving forward. And then uh, we also did some work with our travel demand model. Um, and I've talked about the financial plan as well. So all of these and really everything in our planning process um, has led us to this point. Um, our interagency process, which was, again, the staff working together from Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. Um, as I said, we met frequently for, uh, frankly, a period of months uh, to work through all of this. Um, and there were some things that, as part of that process, helped get us to this point. Um, first was multimodal projects consistent with the priority programs investment strategy that we talked about um, at your October meeting, and I'll show that to you again in a couple slides. Um, again, we really you know, foundationally wanted to have a multimodal set of projects and projects that given our collective limited financial resources, projects that could, you know, do more than one thing or do as much as possible um, in this planning process. So for example, could a transit project be a safety project? Um, could a roadway project, and we do have some of those, we are a growing region, you know, could that roadway project be as multimodal as possible? So on and so forth. So we were really looking for those kind of triple bottom line projects. Um, we are also interested in the planning and project development status of the candidate project or corridor. Um, again, this is a 30 year plan. So we're dealing with a large spectrum of the types of projects that go into this plan. Some projects are very well defined. Um, they're in the project development process. They're on their way. Other projects are more conceptual. You know, they may not be implemented for 20 or 25 years and that's okay. Um, but we wanted to consider that as we put the plan together. Um, obviously projects with regional benefit. Um, combining projects in some cases. Again, we started with a list of 137 candidate projects, but you know we're building a system here. We're building a network. 
Uh, we're building a multimodal system for this region. So in a few cases, we combined a few projects. Um, sometimes there were multiple versions of projects. We put those together, projects that were geographically adjacent. Um, the county transportation forums, uh, many of them ranked their candidate project submittals to us. So we wanted to pay attention to that and honor that as much as possible uh, in putting together this fiscally constrained list. Um, the regional agencies, uh, of course, we have our priorities, wanted that reflected in, um, in the investment strategies and also geographic balance across the region. So when we talk about fiscal constraint and kind of what goes into this plan, there's really sort of several dimensions to that. Um, we're focusing today in this conversation on what we call the new regionally funded projects, meaning the projects that would be funded by uh, revenues over time from our three regional agencies. Um, I'll touch again on the project and program investment priorities uh, that we talked about at your October meeting. Uh, we had some projects that were carryover projects from the 2040 plan. Uh, we also have locally funded projects. I'll touch on those in a minute. And then finally, in our overall financial plan, we have some remaining financial plan categories and allocations that are really more at the sort of meat and potatoes programmatic level. So things like intersection operations, asset management, you know, some of the some of the bread and butter things that go into um, into our transportation system and go into the long range financial plan. So this is the priority investment program strategy. We talked about this at your October meeting. So just as a reminder, um, the idea here is that we wanted to dedicate some dollars towards some specific policy priorities, regional policy priorities in this plan. Some of these projects have been identified now as part of the project list. Many projects will be identified as we go through over the next 30 years. But again, the intention here is that we wanted to highlight um, these specific uh, sort of areas of investment and make this part of um, what we call the program and project investment priorities for uh, the 2050 plan. Um, in terms of these project and program investments, um, again, I said geographic balance is important. You know, hard to do in a 30 year plan. Um, there are some caveats here, but we wanted to kind of show the breakdown of kind of what this looks like across our region. Um, it includes project funding from all of our, you know, all three of our regional agencies. It includes the region-wide programmatic funding that I just touched on. It also includes the carryover projects from the 2040 plan. And I will say that, you know, some of those carryover projects, there are some big projects that frankly do skew this just a little bit um, in terms of trying to do this geographic allocation. Um, and then several projects span multiple counties and we tried to account for that as well, so. And then we also wanted to show you kind of the uh, investments by project type. Um, again, this can also be hard and there are some caveats because as I said earlier, the whole point is that we're looking for multimodal projects that do several things at once. Um, so it's a little bit counterintuitive to put them into, stratify them into distinct buckets, but we at least wanted to give you a sense um, of the overall project types. Um, one thing we've done here from a previous version that some of you have seen is that we've actually broken out those 2040 uh, carryover projects again. Um, there's some big projects there, the I-25 GAP project, the Central 70 project. Um, and so you can see that even just the carryover projects, it's about 26% of the total. Um, and then we have some interstate freeway projects. Almost all of those are managed lane type projects. And I think that's important to point out. A stakeholder actually pointed that out to us that that was a re revelation to them. Uh, we have our rapid transit, um, the bus rapid transit network that we're proposing as well as the transit corridors uh, that we're proposing as part of this. Uh, multimodal arterial roadways, and then our safety, active transportation, and freight-specific projects. Um, and then we were also asked to break out interchange projects just so you could see um, kind of what those were as well. Um, talk just a moment about staging periods. Um, this relates to air quality conformity. Um, it's a federal requirement that we perform our air quality conformity analysis by what we call air quality staging periods. These are primarily 10 and in some cases, five-year staging periods within the plan. This is our best guess at the time as we put the plan together, when do these projects come online? Um, you know, if it's a roadway project, when does, it, uh, when does it open to traffic? Or if it's a transit project, when does it open to revenue service? Um, it's a federal requirement that we need to demonstrate reasonable, in quotes, <laughs> distribution of project costs with available revenues by fiscal constraint funding tiers. What this means is that, you know, we can't just say that the plan is fiscally constrained over the entire 30 years of the plan. Uh, the feds also want us to show that when you look at these sort of 10 year buckets, is the plan fiscally constrained sort of by stage as we go through, um, as we go through the planning period. Uh, so we've kind of shown you uh, what that looks like. We recognize 
Um, you know, everyone wants their project right away, but we do need to stage this um, in a sort of consistent manner over the 30 year life of the plan. Um, and then based on that final fiscal constraint status, uh, we are asking for some limited discretion to work with project sponsors uh, to adjust project staging as needed. You'll actually see an example of that uh, later in this presentation. Um, I also mentioned the locally funded projects. These come from the 2040 plan uh, with two rounds of sponsor modifications. Um, it includes toll highway authority projects and we have reached out um, and coordinated with each of the uh, three toll highway authorities in our region. Um, the regional funding recommendations might modify the proposed locally funded project list. Um, so for example, if there's a project that a sponsor submitted uh, for regional funding that we weren't able to accommodate as part of regional fiscal constraint, um, the sponsor may come back after board action um, and ask to locally fund that project. Uh, so for that reason, we're also asking for limited discretion uh, to finalize the locally funded project list based on um, anticipated board action tomorrow night. Um, down to our last couple slides, I wanted to show you the schedule. I'm not going to go through this point by point, but kind of talked about the main points already. Uh, we have the federal deadline in June 2021. So we're aiming for spring adoption of the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan by the board, uh, along with our public comment and our public hearing process, um, kind of preceding that. Um, so again, this is our aggressive schedule, but we're hoping to get action on the project list and the uh, investment priorities uh, from our board tomorrow night so that we can continue with our air quality conformity work um, and the technical work that we need to do to put the plan together uh, to meet this schedule. So um, this is one slide that was not in your packet. Um, I do wanna uh, talk about one project clarification. Um, in your packet, the Pena Boulevard project is listed, I believe, as a uh, sort of capacity, capacity investment project, but we've been working with uh, the city of Denver and Denver International Airport to better define uh, what this project was. It was initially submitted as a candidate project as more a general purpose sort of uh, capacity project. And certainly it's important uh, to have person throughput uh, between our, you know, between the city and between our, uh, our urban area to the airport. Uh, but we worked with the city and with the airport uh, to see if we could reimagine this project a little bit kind of consistent uh, with our policy priorities and some of the things that we've talked about here today um, in terms of multimodal person throughput um, and through a very collaborative process uh, we've worked together to redefine this project as adding one new managed lane in each direction on Pena Boulevard between I-70 um, and E-470. Uh, we're also moving uh, the staging period that this project would be in the plan. We're actually moving it up to the 2030 to 2039 air quality staging period um, in a couple different phases within that staging period. Um, the cost that we're showing for the project does not change, uh, but the, the portion of Dr. Cog controlled funds would decrease just a little bit, um, as it says, from 30% to 27%. Um, because we're changing the staging period of this project and to maintain fiscal constraint, as I just talked about, by staging period, um, there were four projects that were affected by that. We reached out um, to the project sponsors of these four projects that you see listed here uh, to see if they were willing to have these projects move back one staging period uh, to help maintain fiscal constraint. Um, and we did receive concurrence from each of the project sponsors. So this is one change from what's in your packet uh, that we did want to highlight. And with that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the motion that we're asking for, um, moving to recommend to the Board of Directors the fiscally constraining project and program investment priorities as amended in the slide that I just talked about, um, and then using the TAC language of recognizing, <clears throat> excuse me, the Metro Vision Plan's primary objectives were considered in developing these recommendations. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions <clears throat> before my voice gives out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. Uh, members, uh, if there's any questions or comments on Mr. Rieger's presentation, uh, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone so Mr. Kennedy can call upon you. Mr. Kennedy, I will turn it over to you. Are there any, are there any hands raised, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. At this moment, I don't see any hands raised. All right. With no questions or comments on Mr. Rieger's flawless presentation, uh, I am open to entertaining a motion. If there's anybody who would like to pr pr uh, provide a motion, please raise your virtual hand or press star six. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I see a hand raised from Mr. Doug Tisdale. Director Tisdale. I believe that was, I'm sorry, I believe it was me, Angie Rivetta Malpietti. 
so much. All right. <laughs> Thank, you very, Thank you very much. We have a motion. Uh, is there a second, uh, Mr. Kennedy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I see a second motion from uh, Wen Shaw. Wen, please go ahead. Yes, I second this motion. All right, uh, with a motion and a second, Mr. Kennedy, please open the phone line so we can vote. Okay, they're all open, Mr. Chair. All right, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Yes. Abstain? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. The next section of the agenda is the 2021 RTC meeting schedule. Um, if you downloaded this um, greater than a day or two ago, you may not have the complete uh, schedule. Uh, we will put it in uh, in future board packets, or I'm sorry, committee packets. Uh, please feel free to review the schedule at your leisure. Uh, the next section of uh, the agenda, administrative items. Item seven, member comments or other matters. Uh, if uh, committee members, if you have any comments or other matters, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Mr. Kennedy, are, is there anyone who has other matters or comments, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I see a hand raised from Mr. Doug Tisdale. Doug, if you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, express my appreciation to the chair for running a phenomenally efficient meeting. Thank you, that's all. Uh, thank you, Director Tisdale. You are my uh, idol. Um, with Mr. With that. Mr. Oh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Hi, this is sorry, this is Doug Rex. Um I, I would like to take it just an opportunity because I do see her name at least on the on the list of participants today, um, to welcome Deborah Johnson, the uh, new GEM CEO of RTD. Uh, and I believe she started last week and I'm sure it's been a whirlwind. I had an opportunity to get on a call with her on Friday and uh Boy, I'll tell you what, she didn't disappoint. She's, uh, I think she's going to be a wonderful addition to the RTD team, and we look forward to working with her as part of the Regional Transportation Committee and as a, as a partner in this region. So, Deborah, welcome, and we look forward to many, many more conversations. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other comments or other matters? I will pause. Mr. Chair, I see Deborah Johnson does have a hand raise. Uh, Ms. Johnson, if you're ready, please go ahead. Deborah, you may be uh, self muted. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much. Um, this is Deborah Johnson. I just want to say thank you very much to Doug for those welcoming remarks. I greatly appreciate them, and I wanted to greet all of you and let you know that, yes, I did begin my uh, new tenure here at the RTD on Monday, November 9th, and wanted to express that I look forward to working cooperatively and collaboratively with all of you all as we uh, push the regional transportation agenda here in the greater Denver area. So I look forward to taking the opportunity to get to know each and every one of you and wanted to reiterate that uh, RTD looks forward to continuing the collaborative working relationship we've had thus far. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. We appreciate the kind words and we also uh, look forward to working with you to further our collaborative interests as well. Um, Mr. Kennedy, any additional uh, hands raised? No, Mr. Chair, not at this time. All right, uh, seeing no hands raised, we'll move to the next item. The next meeting, December 15th, 2020, uh, please feel free to mark it on your calendars. Uh, and with that, the next item is adjournment at 9.05. Thank you, everybody. See you next month.